Legal cannabis is the fastest growing industry in the United States. Even though the plant is illegal federally, the legal cannabis market grew 74% in 2014 to about $2.7 billion. This year, the market is expected to grow another 32%. So far, 23 states have legalized medical cannabis, 4 states in DC have legalized recreational cannabis, and 12 states have laws allowing high CBD oil. Furthermore, at least 10 more states are considering legalizing recreational cannabis within the next two years through ballot measures or state legislatures, and other states are seeking to decriminalize cannabis or legalize it for medical use. It's estimated that by 2019, all of the state legal cannabis markets combined will amount to an $11 billion industry. The annual 420 rallies were larger than ever this year, showcasing just how mainstream cannabis has become. Millions of people gathered at events worldwide, including about 125,000 who attended Denver's 420 rally. Oh, Brooke, this is officially called the Cannabis Cup here in Colorado, which is ground zero of this marijuana legalization movement. And we are literally seeing tens of thousands of marijuana enthusiasts here mingling with hundreds of cannabis companies that have converged from all around the country. So we're going to watch the process here and this is a company that's okay. giving some examples of how their products work and you can see these lighting the marijuana on one end the participant here is sucking in and now he's going to really get a big shot of that smoke as he releases the chamber. And we're told and it's it supposed like to be a, a really gun, smooth hit. Anna. How did it feel? It felt amazing actually. It's hard to report out here and keep a straight face. Not everyone enjoys or tolerates 420 or legalized cannabis, however. Today is April 20th, 420, so Fox is going to get in on the action on Fox and Friends. Um, now, are they going to talk about the medical benefits of marijuana that has been shown over and over again? Are they going to talk about how Colorado has legalized it and the state of Colorado did not explode? that nobody's heads exploded in Washington State either or in all the other places where we have medical marijuana. No, they're not going to say any of that. Uh, instead, they're going to say, be scared, be very, very scared, marijuana is terrible and horrible, go. 420, a self-proclaimed pot holiday where thousands of people all across the country, they flocked to Denver to celebrate their newfound weed freedom. So is this really a healthy celebration or something much more dangerous? For the second year in a row, we sent our Hannity crew to Denver to check it all out and hear the bright, intelligent, this is the future of America right here. 420! This is about the expression of, of living in America and being able to do what you want with your own body. They get high every day. <laughs> part of me that wants to be a libertarian here. I want to say, look, do what you want with your life. It's none of my right. business. But in reality, do, I, do we really want a nation where our kids have access to all of these drugs and are getting stoned? And is this the beginning of a slippery slope where all drugs are legalized? Well, for, do we really want a nation in which there are still 700,000 people plus a year who are involved with marijuana arrests? Do you want those worries about that, which are understandable, to be enshrined at the point of the government? Do I want this to ruin a, a stupid college kid's life? Run. No. Right. Exactly. I will concede the point. But do we really, is this, do we want a nation of stoners? Hey. Skunk is a new form of crossbred marijuana that has intensified levels of the neurotoxin, the intoxicating element, THC. It runs at levels of 20 to 30 percent THC. That contrasts with the marijuana of the Cheech and Chong days when it was only 3 to 4 percent. So you're talking six to seven times more powerful, more potent, and it's really getting people blasted and blitzed in a hurry. This is to underline the fact that these, this is dangerous, more dangerous than you're being led to believe. That's why we're talking about it, not to sell it. Butter is another term. What is it? B-U-D-D-E-R. Butter takes the next step into an arena we haven't even seen before. This is unprecedented. Butter is the concentrate, an extract of all the marijuana THC. They produce it by running butane through the marijuana leaf and extract the pure THC. The potency levels are extraordinary, 70 to 90 percent potency. People take a single hit from vaporizing this right. stuff and they're completely blitzed. It's leading to hallucinations. It's leading to bizarre behavior. And it's very much increasing the risk of addiction and right. uh, being trapped by this drug. Edibles, We've never seen this before. Edibles possibly the most dangerous because you have no idea what you're getting and when it's going to hit. I love these scare taxis, blitz, loaded, blasted, S six to seven times more potent than Cheech and Chong stuff. Okay, well, 
That's interesting. So, well, if it's that potent, I'm sure everybody's going to the emergency rooms across the country on overdosing on marijuana, right? I mean, it's so much more potent. Oh, right, nobody's doing that. There are no overdose cases of marijuana. The best way to tell if cannabis legalization is successful or causing harm, like Fox News would have you believe, is to look at states where the plant is now legal. Because Colorado was the first state to have a legal recreational cannabis market, it has been under a microscope since, and the results have proven cannabis legalization to be beneficial, not damaging. If you look at really every major thought leader that has examined the last year in Colorado, that has looked at the data, that has been out here anywhere from on the left, the New York Times, to on the right, the Rand Institute, to the Brookings Institute, to the Denver Post, all these uh, you know, thought leaders, policy leaders are saying, you know, this appears to be working. It appears to be uh, you know, functioning in a way that, that in fact may make Colorado a better place. We've actually had a uh, decrease post-legalization in crime uh, across the board in Colorado, particularly in Denver. Traffic fatalities are at record low, and there's a lot of concern, and rightfully so. You know, we've legalized this substance. Are people going to drive while impaired? How's that going to look? And, and it's just worth noting that, that traffic fatalities are actually down. A lot of people said there would be a massive spike, uh, and tons of teens would be using marijuana for the first time ever, and, and, and it would be terrible. And in fact, we've seen no statistically significant change. It's worth noting that in other states, uh, and you know, these this all comes from sort of state and federal data um, that have not legalized marijuana. They've seen spikes. There was a lot of discussion uh, that if Colorado were to uh, legalize marijuana, will no longer be an attractive place for business. And what we've seen in the last year has just been stunning. At least in the Denver area, we have Google you know, moving a 1,500-person headquarters there. It doesn't seem to be scaring people away from locating their businesses here. In fact, you could say in, in the case of Google and other things, I mean, perhaps this is, in, in fact, an incentive to businesses that may want to move here and not have some of their staff be criminalized. We've had about 10,000 direct jobs in this industry. Right, that's not you know a small number in, in what is considered sort of a down economy. We were claw, you know according to President Obama, we're clawing our way out of this sort of recession, if you will. Maybe we turn that corner, but we do know in the last several years it has not been a, a, a positive economic climate. And a lot of those jobs, at least according to some uh, studies coming out of the US Free University of Denver, are jobs that start at like seventeen dollars an hour. Or that's the average wage, much better than what you might get at in, in any other sort of entry level jobs. There's ancillary jobs that, that, have, that have risen up around this. You know, my law firm, for instance, we employ about 25 people. All we do is marijuana work. That's all we do is, is represent marijuana businesses, work on marijuana policy. Construction, you know, talk to anyone who's in the, the real estate or construction business, particularly around warehouses, and many of these are being rented out that have just been vacant for a very long period of time. The outcome has even changed the minds of some Coloradans, including Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper, who was once an opponent of cannabis legalization in his state. Hickenlooper voiced concern during the amendment process, calling the voters reckless for their decision, adding that he would have vetoed the amendment if he could. Moreover, Hickenlooper wouldn't appear at weed shops on opening day. Now, however, Hickenlooper says that cannabis legalization is not only working for Colorado, it's beneficial. I gotta give you a shout out right now for Colorado. Your unemployment rate is 4.2%, way below the national average. Part of it is uh, we've been the destination for young people uh, with a the last six years. Either us or Washington DC, the number one destination for millennials. And they bring with them job creation. They bring with them innovation and, and a lot of technology smarts. So they're helping drive this. And they look at marijuana and they say, hey, we can drink whiskey. Why can't we you know, have a legalized system with marijuana? Right. Well, I think that if you look back, it has turned out not to be as vexing. Now the, the voters spoke, so we're trying to make it work. We are slowly through hard work building a regulatory system, you know, making sure we keep it out of the hands of kids, making sure we keep our streets and roads safe, uh, making sure we, we begin to kill the, the, the illegal black market, right? Drug dealers don't care who they sell to. And, and we're, getting it, we're, we're getting there. I, I think you're right. We did a special a couple of years ago on marijuana. It was the single best, most watched program ever <laughs> on cable. And we were all like, wow, you know, what does this say about America? America smokes pot. Colorado's cannabis industry continues to grow. In 2014 alone, about $700 million was generated from cannabis sales. And while the industry stimulates the economy, creates jobs, increases quality of life, diminishes the black market, 
decreases crime and arrests, and brings in substantial tax revenue. This apparently isn't enough for some politicians and pundits who seem to expect cannabis consumers to fund the state's entire budget. It started years ago with all the people like, hemp can fix everything. <laughs> um, and one of the things you would hear about marijuana legalization is that it's this big boon to state budgets. The Colorado provision actually is supposed to send $40 million a year to school construction, but they only collected enough to, to put $20 million towards school construction based on the way their rules work. So like, oh. is... Why should should we be legalizing marijuana? I spoke with someone yesterday who said that uh, prices in the Denver area have fallen between 16 and 30 percent just in the last five months. Uh, Mark Kleiman, who's an expert on drug policy at UCLA, setting up the Washington state legal market, thinks prices are going to go as low as two dollars a gram. So 10 percent of that uh, survey based uh, market price in New York City that Lynette $2 just quoted. Two dollars a gram. Two dollars a gram. And so the thing is. People will buy from the commercial stores if it's only $2 a gram, but the taxes in Colorado are set as a percentage of price. Sure. So if the price craters like that, the revenues are going to crater too. The state of Colorado received about $69 million in taxes during the first year of cannabis sales, much less than the projected $118 million. But that's still $69 million more than the state previously had. And surely the moral benefits of cannabis legalization outweigh the monetary incentives. It actually never crossed my mind that the economic justice justification for liberalizing weed would be because of the you know because of the impact on the budget or the fact that you'd be able to spend money it would be something that would happen over time right the fact that a lot of people a lot of young people wouldn't be going to jail for something that's really quite stupid right and that over time you'd you end up with a you know a better labor force people with cleaner records they get jobs they spend money that kind of thing that that would be the justification for yeah, it, it. Just i never in, kind of in general the you know pot uh, prohibition was not a very good use of society's resources. So um, rather than, you know, how much money are we going to make, I think, you know, not, not wasting a lot of police resources on trying to crack down on people smoking pot is a lot better of a justification. That's saving. Washington, D.C. followed Colorado and Washington State's example and legalized cannabis in February 2015. The voters of Washington, D.C. voted by a 70% margin in favor of legalization. In Washington, D.C., there are 143 precincts. Do you know how many precincts voted in favor of legalization? 142. Only one precinct voted against this, and this was in the upper northwest quadrant of D.C., one of the whitest and most affluent uh, uh, regions of, of D.C. And in that jurisdiction, in that precinct, it uh, lost by only nine votes. But you can't buy it, and you can't sell it. Do you know what you can do? give it away. That's why people are handing out thousands of free marijuana seeds in Washington, D.C., and there's a line around the block to get them. There's a whole lot of our culture that has been forced in the closet, and it's wonderful to see light in the cracks. The voters and the council have said that possession and growing your own is legal, but Congress is saying no. Some in Congress don't want to legalize something that is mind-altering and might be bad for your health. I'll have a whiskey, please. The man in Congress who's leading the charge against D.C.'s new pot law is Utah Republican Jason Chaffetz, the chairman of the House Oversight Committee. The idea that this is going to be a haven for pot smoking, I, I, I can't support that. Uh, so this is a re really a extreme libertarian dream of having legal marijuana and no way to regulate it. This is the gift the Tea Party has given us in Washington, D.C. Despite Republican interference, the effects have already been beneficial, especially for the black population of D.C. who are being targeted for cannabis by police disproportionately to whites. Between 2001 and 2010, American police made more than 8 million pot-related arrests at a cost of about $3.6 billion a year. During that time, D.C. had the highest marijuana arrest rate in the country where black residents were eight times as likely to be arrested than white residents, even though both groups use marijuana at nearly the same rates. And that's not gonna happen here in Washington, D.C. Now my brothers, my cousins, my friends who are African-American males aren't getting locked up for a $5 bag, you know, of weed. So that, that to me means a lot. With four states in D.C. successfully legalizing cannabis, supporters in at least 10 more states are looking to do the same. Some states, like California, will be voting whether to legalize cannabis next year. If you could have full legalization in California after after the 2016, there's a referendum on the ballot there? Uh, it will be, without a doubt. As, as sure as I have a nose on my face, Californians will be voting once again and only lost by three percentage points in 2010. You think it'll pass? Absolutely. This change would help fix the medical cannabis market in California that is used by many 
many recreational users anyway. But there is one problem with cultivating cannabis in the state. California is in a major drought and it takes a lot of water to grow cannabis. However, this wouldn't be an issue if California imported cannabis from other states or nations with relaxed cannabis laws that aren't gripped with drought. With cannabis laws changing so quickly in the US, it's easier to name the states where cannabis legalization probably won't occur, at least anytime soon. These states are likely Alabama, Louisiana, Idaho, Kansas, Oklahoma, South Carolina, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Utah. Many of these states are Republican controlled, still prohibit or have regions that prohibit alcohol, and of course medical cannabis, and state poll results don't favor legalized weed. Out of all states in the nation, Louisiana is the worst for cannabis use, as people can get 20 years in prison for repeat pot possession and life in prison if they have a previous felony. While these state laws may seem draconian, they are still backed by the federal government's official stance on cannabis. And despite the government's willingness to impose strict laws on its citizens, a recent Department of Justice report showed that members of four US agencies routinely violate more serious laws. Agents from the DEA, ATF, FBI, and US Marshal Services were found to be attending so-called sex parties with prostitutes in Colombia. What's more, the parties were paid for by drug cartels. And while regular Americans are being locked up for decades for cannabis offenses, the federal agents only received two to ten day suspensions and some were even promoted. None were fired. However, based on her knowledge of these events for years and a vote of no confidence by congressional lawmakers, DEA head Michelle Leonhardt is resigning in May. Her replacement is unknown. Every president we've had since 1993 has violated our drug laws, sometimes in very serious ways that would trigger mandatory minimum sentences in some cases. It's increasingly very hard now to find uh, elected officials, candidates who can run for office, who can claim they've been drug free their entire lives. So and it's not just the uh, typical people that, you know, the Al Gores and the Al Frankens, sure, but there's also Newt Gingrich, Rick Santorum, they've all used marijuana. And I'm not just saying this to, to embarrass them, but it, this is a question of legitimacy. These are the people who are writing our laws, who are voting on our laws, um, and the question has to be asked, would a good, uh, tough sentence have been good for them? Uh, would an arrest record of criminal, would that have helped them in their lives and in their careers? Um, if not, then why is it so good for everyone else? The upcoming 2016 federal election is important for U.S. cannabis legalization, not only for states voting whether to legalize, but for the future of the entire U.S. cannabis industry. In 2017, a new president could decide to re-establish cannabis prohibition in Colorado and other states where the plant is now legal recreationally and medically. If Hillary Clinton becomes the next US president, her administration could merely mimic the Obama administration by mostly ignoring the issue. I think we need to um, be very clear uh, about the benefits of marijuana use for medicinal purposes. I don't think we've done enough uh, research yet, although I think for people who are in extreme medical conditions and have anecdotal evidence that it works, uh, there should be availability under appropriate circumstances. Uh, but I do think we need more research because we don't know how it interacts with other drugs. There's a lot that we don't know. So on medicinal, on medicinal purposes, on recreational, you know, states are the laboratories of democracy. We have at least two states that are experimenting with that right now, I want to wait and see what the evidence is. Do you want to wait and try it? You said you've Absolutely. never smoked. Uh, <laughs> no, that, 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 uh, I didn't do when I was young. I'm not going to start now. <laughs> However, in the wake of the Baltimore protests, Clinton finally publicly acknowledged the serious problems with criminal justice in the United States and the need for action. There is something profoundly wrong when African American men are still far more likely to be stopped and searched by police charged with crimes and sentenced to longer prison terms than are meted out to their white counterparts. There is something wrong when a third of all black men face the prospect of prison during their lifetimes. And an estimated 1.5 million black men are, quote, missing from their families and communities because of incarceration and premature death. There is something wrong when more than one out of every three young black men in Baltimore cannot find a job. There is something wrong when trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve breaks down as far as it has in many of our communities. 
we have allowed our criminal justice system to get out of balance. Today, there seems to be a growing bipartisan movement for common sense reforms in our criminal justice system. Senators as disparate on the political spectrum as Cory Booker and Rand Paul and Dick Durbin and Mike Lee are reaching across the aisle to find ways to work together. It is rare to see Democrats and Republicans agree on anything today, but we're beginning to agree on this. We need to restore balance to our criminal justice system. It is not enough just to agree and give speeches about it. We actually have to work together to get the job done. We need to deliver real reforms that can be felt on our streets, in our courthouses, in our jails and prisons, in communities too long neglected. We can start by making sure that federal funds for state and local law enforcement are used to bolster best practices rather than to buy weapons of war that have no place on our streets. It's a stark fact that the United States has less than 5% of the world's population. Yet we have almost 25% of the world's total prison population. The numbers today are much higher than they were 30, 40 years ago, despite the fact that crime is at historic lows. Of the more than 2 million Americans incarcerated today, a significant percentage are low-level offenders, people held for violating parole or minor drug crimes or who are simply awaiting trial in backlogged courts. Keeping them behind bars does little to reduce crime, but it does a lot to tear apart families and communities. One in every 28 children in our country now has a parent in prison. Think about what that means for those children. The price of incarcerating a single inmate is often more than $30,000 per year and up to $60,000 in some states. That's the salary of a teacher or a police officer. One year in a New Jersey state prison costs $44,000 more than the annual tuition at Princeton. If the United States brought our correctional expenditures back in line with where they were several decades ago, we'd save an estimated $28 billion a year, and I believe we would not be less safe. You can pay a lot of police officers and nurses and others with $28 billion to help us deal with the pipeline issues. It's time to change our approach. It's time to end the era of mass incarceration. Despite Clinton's encouraging speech about criminal justice reform, she didn't talk about cannabis, the most widely used illegal drug, accounting for a majority of drug arrests. Surprisingly, the only contender for the U.S. presidency currently taking action to change the criminal justice system is a Republican. Senator Rand Paul. One of the laws that bothers me the most is something called civil forfeiture. Civil forfeiture is where the government can take your stuff whether they've convicted you of a crime or not. I think that most of our judicial system, for most of who believe in it, is that you're innocent until proven guilty. Civil forfeiture does the opposite. I'll give you a couple of examples. Christos Sorvelos is a family uh, in Philadelphia. Their teenage son sold $40 worth of illegal drugs off the back porch. The government took their house, evicted them, and barricaded them. And I was like, how are we making anything better when we take the house? Maybe the house is a stabilizing force in the family. Maybe it's grandma's house and the kid's 15 years old. Why would we take grandma's house? Why would we take the family's house based on... Not even, an, uh, not even a conviction on an accusation of the child who doesn't own the house. There are a lot of other things that we need to fix in our society. One of them is uh, something we call mandatory minimums. What mandatory minimums do is say that if you commit an infraction, that you have to serve a mandatory sentence, sometimes 15 years, sometimes life in prison. I'll give you an example. Weldon Angelos is a 24-year-old kid and he sold $300 worth of marijuana. He got a mandatory sentence of 55 years. You can kill somebody in Kentucky and be eligible for parole in 12 years. Something is wrong here. To compound this, there's a racial outcome to this. 
I don't think there's a racial intention, but I tell people that I think they're not looking if they don't think that the incarceration problem in our country is not skewed towards one race. A friend of mine's brother grew marijuana plants at University of Kentucky 30 years ago. He's a convicted felon. He has to check the box every time he goes to look for a job, and he can't vote. So Cory Booker and I have put together a bill, we call it the REDEEM Act, and what it does is it takes some of these minor felonies, mostly drug possession and some drug sale, and says if you've been punished, you're out of jail, you've paid your debt to society, and there's a certain period of time you should get rid of your records. Also, the bill that I have with Cory Booker, it gets rid of solitary confinement for teenagers. Why we're putting teenagers in solitary confinement, I don't know. But I can tell you one story that horrified me, and this was in the New Yorker a couple of months ago. Khalif Browder is a young black man, 16 years old, in the Bronx. He's picked up and accused of a crime. I have no idea whether he committed the crime or not. But I can tell you that it's a crime against what America stands for, that he was sent to Rikers for three years, in solitary confinement, not the whole time, but many trips to solitary confinement for three years in prison and he was never tried. Have these people not heard of the Sixth Amendment? Have they not heard of a speedy trial? Khalif Browder tried to commit suicide three times. I don't know what happened to him in Rikers, but it certainly wasn't good. It certainly wasn't fair. So I have another bill we call the Reset Bill. We take minor felonies, Mostly non, all nonviolent, but mostly drug felonies, and we make them misdemeanors. We're not saying it's okay. We're not saying it's legal. We're just saying that it'll be a misdemeanor. You will never lose your right to vote, and you will never lose your opportunity to work by having it permanently on your record. These are things that if we do, I think we can radically transform our country. While attempting serious reform, Paul also doesn't claim to have a wait-and-see approach in regards to Colorado and other states like Obama and Clinton do. He thinks legalization is a state's rights issue that shouldn't be obstructed by the federal government. I would let states choose, and I don't know what will happen, whether it's going to end up being good or bad, but I would let the states choose because I believe in federalism and state, states' rights. But I think it is hypocritical for very wealthy white people who have all the resources to evade the drug laws to say, oh, well, I mean, particularly in Jeb Bush's case, he's against even allowing medical marijuana for people that are confined to wheelchairs from multiple sclerosis. Here's what some other people who think they might be president have to say about cannabis. Good idea. Legalizing marijuana, bad idea. Well, I was told Colorado provided the brownies here today. A <laughs> whole lot of folks now are talking about legalizing pot. The brownies you had this morning were provided by the state of Colorado. I actually think this is a great embodiment of what Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis called the laboratories of democracy. If the citizens of Colorado decide they want to go down that road, that's their prerogative. I don't agree with it, but that's their right. The laws say one thing, and mind you, these are criminal laws. These are laws that say if you do X, Y, and Z, you will go to prison. The president announced, no, you won't. Those words on that law book thing on your shelf, pay no attention to those. I don't want my kids to smoke marijuana, and I don't want other people's kids to smoke marijuana. I don't think there's a responsible way to recreationally use marijuana. Marijuana is illegal under federal law. That, that should be enforced. It should be enforced. I, you know, I understand that states have decided to legalize possession under state law, yeah. but uh, and the trafficking, the sale of these uh, products, I mean, that, that's a federal crime. Right now it's not being enforced. Look, we live in a country that already has problems with substance abuse, okay? We already see the impact that alcoholism is having on families, on drunk driving, on all sorts of things. And now we're going to add one more substance uh, that, that people can use. Jeb Bush is signing with opponents of an initiative on Florida's November election ballot to make medical marijuana legal, despite strong public support for its use as a treatment for debilitating illnesses. I don't care about the tax money that may come from it. And I don't care, quite frankly, that people think it's inevitable. It's not inevitable here. I'm not going to permit it. Never, as long as I'm governor. You want to elect somebody else who's willing to legalize marijuana and expose our children to that gateway drug and the effects it has on their brain? You'll have to live with yourself if you do that, but it's not going to be this governor who does it. Go to Colorado and see if you want to live there. See if you want to live in a major city in Colorado where there's you know head shops popping up on mm -hmm. every corner and people flying into your airport just to come and get high.
To ensure the next president can't simply reverse the progress made in states where cannabis is now legal, recreationally and medically, the Obama administration needs to support the bipartisan group of lawmakers currently attempting to implement smarter federal cannabis laws. A solid framework of laws, coupled with the new cannabis markets appearing in states throughout the nation, will make ending cannabis legalization difficult. In the meantime, the state-by-state -state legalization efforts continue, and the massive U.S. weed market keeps growing.